believe Isaac Schroeder requires yep. very little introduction. I understand wow. he's well known here in Victoria. But for those of you that are new, um, he's a lead engineer at MetaLab Designs. He's had the pleasure of working on projects for well-known clients like Uber and Walmart. He dabbles in front end and back end systems and just about everything in between and loves playing with new technologies. Isaac has spoken at every startup. Well, the past, past couple, yeah, at yeah. least. <laughs> And I um, want you guys to please welcome him for this session, give him your attention, and we'll draw the prizes at the end. Enjoy. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, just to ask, the mic is recording me, or is there like, supposed to be further sound that's going just here? Recording. Just recording, OK. OK, so we're going to talk about GraphQL today. Uh, you can have a look up there. You can follow along in the slides. They'll include some handy dandy links for you. Uh, and we're going to be doing a bit of live coding at the same time uh, over on that screen there with my good friend Ian. So let's talk about GraphQL. GraphQL provides three things cohesively together and opinions on them uh, that all APIs kind of need to do. So the first thing it provides is a data description language which is a way of specifying the things that you want to talk about in your API. The second thing it provides is a query resolution mechanism, which is a mechanism to allow you to link the stuff that you want uh, and a way to get that. So to be able to say, you know, I have a movie, I want to fetch that from IMDb, or I have a comment, I want to fetch that from Discus, uh, et cetera. And the last thing it provides is a query language and data format. And that allows the consumer, the clients, the people on iOS apps and web apps to be able to send requests. So we'll talk about those in a little bit of detail. So we got the data description language. And in GraphQL, that's called the schema. And that's going to let us describe the things that we want to talk about. So in our case here, we got a movie uh, and an actor. And a movie has some fields in it, a title and a rating. And it's a string and an int. And an actor has a name and an age, string and an int. And this is pretty similar to people who've done object-oriented design, Java. You know, you make a class, it has some properties, this kind of thing. So all of that should be a little bit familiar. Uh, existing APIs, so for example, you're making a REST API. Uh, REST doesn't really offer you anything like this. You have to kind of venture further out uh, and get into things that build on top of REST uh, that give you stuff like this. So things like Open API, Swagger, API Blueprints are all other mechanisms that fall uh, into this line of things. So then we got the query resolution mechanism. And this is the thing that describes how the data for those types is going to be fetched. And so GraphQL sits there, you run some code, and you contact some services, and you return the code. Uh, REST equivalent is that you have some HTTP handlers. So you're running like Sinatra or Express or um, Cowboy or some other HTTP server. You write handlers for your endpoints, uh, and those handlers perform some kind of action. And lastly, we have the query language data format. And it's this common standard that allows us to describe the things that we want to fetch. And most importantly, it also describes the shape of the stuff that's coming back. Uh, and this is also something the majority of REST APIs are sorely, sorely lacking. So if you have a REST API, the way that you fetch data is typically described by resources. So you have a get, some resource identifier. Uh, but more complex operations are hard to describe. And the response format for REST also is very ill-defined. Uh, there's a couple of good standards out there. If you are making a REST API, then something like JSON API is really, really good. It defines the actual response format for what you're doing. Uh, but again, the big seller on GraphQL is that it provides all of these things together, provides a standard, and so everyone kind of agrees upon it. It's not just like this really fragmented ecosystem of a lot of different standards competing with one another. So uh, we're going to get into those things in detail here. So first, we're going to talk about the schema, the thing that defines the types in the API that we want to build. So we have this example app here, which is a uh, Metaflix, uh, no copyright infringement intended. And it has a movie that it's showing and uh, a little bit of information about that movie. And so we're going to model that. right? And we call this process something like design-driven API modeling. right? Design team comes to you and says, here is what we want to build. Uh, and you can start looking at that as an API designer and say, this is about what the design is going to include. So we got a movie up there. And the way that we describe types in GraphQL uh, is just 
looks almost like annotated JSON kind of. Uh, you have a type declaration, you have the name of that type, you open it with curly bracket, and you have a bunch of fields and their types in there. And so most things in your API are going to have some unique identifier, we'll call that an ID. And, and then we have stuff that's actually in the design. So the title maps to the title that's over there, the rating maps to the collection of stars and the, the numeric value that's there, uh, review count, and so on. So, so literally everything's just coming straight out of the design. Uh, and we can do all this without writing a line of API code, which is great. Uh, for those not familiar, the little bang at the end, the exclamation mark, means that a type is not nullable. And not nullable is just a way of saying that a value must always be returned for that. So every movie must have a title. Every movie must have a number of reviews. But not every movie may have a rating, right? You can imagine a system where you have a new movie that hasn't yet been rated, and so there's no rating data available for it, and so that can be nullable. And so that's what the, uh, that's what the bang there represents. GraphQL comes with a handful of built-in types. Uh, we have integers, floats, strings, uh, IDs. Um, and you can define your own types, obviously, as demonstrated there. And so this is kind of the summary of what we just talked about. There's the handful of those built-in types, ints, floats, strings, booleans, IDs. You can find more information about those. Those types don't have other fields, right? You can't expand those types. You can't go into them. Uh, they're not complicated. GraphQL calls them scalar types. Uh, you can make a non-null type by adding the bang at the end of it. We talked about that. And types can reference other types. So uh, you could have a movie that has similar movies to it. And so a type can be self-referential. That's totally fine. Uh, and you can reference other things that you've defined in your schema. Important thing to note, a lot of people think this is straight mapping to a database. Not the case. That's no, no, common misconception. Uh, what you're doing is you're modeling how the data is related together, not implementing how the data is related together. And so in a database, right, you'd have some link with an ID, and that ID would connect to another table and all this kind of stuff. None of that in GraphQL. You just purely describe you know, a movie has a publisher, and a publisher is a company. Um, there's no, no linking metadata, just straight objects. We're going to get a little more complicated. We got another screen here, which is that review screen. And we have a couple of people who are giving their feedback on this movie. And we're going to do the same thing. We're going to take the design and <laughs> great reviews, yes. We're going to take the design, and we're going to uh, model that design uh, as an API. And so a movie, obviously, you can have a bunch of reviews. Now, important thing to note here, fields can be parameterized, which means when you fetch a field, you can attach additional information about how that field is going to be fetched. Um, types can also be wrapped, encapsulated, augmented, uh, if you need to return additional information, right? So all the reviews there, we could have you know, hundreds or thousands of reviews. We don't want to return all those reviews at once. And in order to encapsulate that paging data, we make a new type that includes that metadata as well as the actual data we're looking for. So there's this review type that has a reviews field in it, which is the actual review data. That square bracket there is list of. Uh, and so that, that encapsulation is our mechanism of providing that metadata. And at the top, the movie has a reviews field, and that field is parameterized with a page number. So we can access that field multiple times, and we can request um, that field to be resolved with you know, different pages, and we can cycle through things that way. Uh, and then the review itself uh, is just going to look like how uh, all the other ones have. It's going to have a uh, text, a user, this kind of thing. So this is just what we talked about there. Uh, fields can be parameterized. This makes them much more like functions uh, than just static properties. Used frequently for doing things like pagination, sorting, uh, filtering, this kind of stuff. Uh, if you need to return extra data, you're going to wrap that field. Same way we just looked at there. Uh, <clears throat> and you can make list types by uh, putting little curly bra uh, square brackets sorry, uh, around them. And uh, important, or not important, but uh, common pitfall. Most list types will be non-null. Uh, so the type that's in the middle of the list, saying list of something, that field's going to be non-null, because you don't want a list with holes in it, right? You don't want three integers and null and another three integers. It doesn't make any sense most of the time. So inner value typically going to be non-null. And then the outer value also typically not null, because most times you'd rather deal with an empty list than both empty list and null. And this is kind of what that relationship looks like. And this is the graph idea of GraphQL, right? You have some initial type, 
And then that type references other types, and you can keep unfurling and expanding and exploring the graph. So we have a movie. The movie has a title. Its title is Predestination. It has a rating of 4.6. Movie has a bunch of actors. And every actor is a certain type. And again, this, this is very similar to how kind of object-oriented programming works, except you're building this uh, straight into the API, more or less. And this is the thing that we're going to be building the uh, API for our wonderful non-copyright infringement movie consumption app called Metaflix. It's available at that URL, so if you're following along in the slides, you can just open that URL. Uh, you can have a look at the designs for that. And the first task that we're going to do is completing the type. So what we just talked about, um, we basically are going to look at those designs, and we're going to finish implementing the types for those. There's a link to something called Launchpad, which basically lets you create a GraphQL server in your browser. You simply need to click on that. You need to log in uh, in order to actually do anything. You just sign in through GitHub. You click OK. You'll come back. Click the fork button. The fork button will give you your own special magic box that you can play in and do whatever you want with. Uh, and then we can just start getting to work here. And so my lovely assistant, Ian, here is we're going to run through uh, that workshop on the right-hand side here. And this is the design we're going to be doing. So we have. Again, basic idea, right? We have a movie there. And so in our GraphQL schema, we have a movie type. And we're going to start adding fields to that movie type. So we have a title. So we're going to add a title that's got a string to that movie type. And of course, every movie has a title, so it's going to be not nullable. Then we have some actors in there. So we're going to have a field for actors. And that field's going to be an array of actors. Again, not nullable, because you'd rather have an empty array than a null array. After that, we're going to have an array of genres. And those are just going to be some strings. And following that guy, we're going to have a rating. It's going to be some floating point value, because that's going to be the average of all the ratings you just have submitted. We're going to have total number of reviews. And we're going to have a synopsis. And again, it, it pretty much follows what you would expect if you were building a, you know object-oriented Java class declaration or something like that. And at the bottom, you can't see in this, but if you actually open the design and you scroll down a little bit, there are some related movies in there, are similar movies. So we're going to have one field for similar movies. And that's just going to be an array of movies. And so now movie is pretty much done. And we get to move on to the other fun one. We get to move on to review. So we look at review. We think, oh, well, what properties does review have? Well, each review is going to have a, a rating value to it, which is going to be an, a non-null integer. Uh, each rating is going to have a date that it was posted at. Each review is going to have a user that posted that review. Uh, and that's pretty close to it for the review. Um, maybe we're going to add that one other field on the movie as well, because the movie is going to have those reviews. So the movie itself, we're going to go back, and we're going to add that um, array of reviews to the movie. We're not going to do that complex pagination stuff here, um, just due to time. We don't have a lot of it. So we're just going to have that list of reviews uh, in our movie field. And this is great, right? We, we have <coughs> done uh, a lot of the prototyping work uh, that would other, otherwise be way too complicated or way too uh, labor involved uh, if you were to do this a lot of other ways. You can just like, you can open your browser, you can get started on your API, and, and you can have a template in all of you know, a couple of minutes, uh, which is fantastic. Uh, if you haven't quite gotten this far, I'm kind of hoping there'll be a little bit of time at the end where we can continue going on. Uh, I just want to keep going through because there's a lot to cover, uh, and I want to make sure that we don't run out of time for that. So we talked about types that we define, right? We look at the design, we're like, oh, this design has a couple of these types, this type has some properties. We also got to think about how we're going to start getting that data initially in. And GraphQL provides two special types uh, called query and mutation. 
And they work just like all of the other types that we, we have defined before, except GraphQL kind of attaches a little bit of special meaning to those types. And the idea is that when you start your GraphQL server, GraphQL is going to give you a query object that you can request fields from initially. So it's like pretending you have a query object already ready, and you can start asking for fields from it. So when we make our API, and we want to start pulling data onto the screen right away, we're just going to extend this query type, and we're going to give it fields such that we can use those fields, use the, this idea of accessing those fields to pull the data that we want. So to render this screen, we're going to need a movie. So to query a movie, we're going to add a movie field to the query type, and we're going to parameterize it with an ID because we want to request a specific movie. And it's going to return us a movie, which could be nullable because obviously we can request a movie that doesn't exist, and so it should return null. Uh, and so this is the idea for queries for fetching data. For modifying data, for, for taking actions, exact same principle, except they just decided to call it mutation instead. And the reason they did this is because the idea is that requesting these fields produces side effects. So normally when you request a movie, requesting that movie multiple times is going to re return the same thing, right? It's idempotent. The thing with like movie is that it has a side effect. When you request this field, something is going to happen behind the scenes. It's going to perform some magic for you. And so GraphQL treats mutation specially. It basically serializes your requests for those fields. So you know that if you call like movie three times in a row, they're going to happen one after another, and you're not going to run into weird race conditions or misorderings of things. So that's just what we talked about. Query mutation types, they work just like other types, but have special semantics. When asking for data, <coughs> we're always given this root query object we can request fields from. When we want to modify data, we're given that mutation object. And field access on that mutation object uh, is serialized, which prevents those race conditions. So we're going to do the same thing. We're going to finish off the rest of our schema here by uh, looking back at that design. And we're going to finish off the query and mutation types. Also remember, if you're editing online in that pad editor, click the Save button often, because it doesn't save for you. Uh, sometimes it seems like it does. Uh, it doesn't. And you will lose a whole bunch of work and cry. <laughs> so here's our design. We're going to update our schema over here. So we look at the first screen, right? We need to get data from this screen, so we need to extend the query type. We have uh, basically a set of movies, right? At the top. You can see that there's it's maybe a little bit hard to see on the monitor here, but it's a carousel, right? So you have a, a couple of movies that you would want to request here. And each other thing, uh, like competing movie apps, such as Netflix, you browse them, right? You have a bunch of movies you can, you can swipe through. We're going to do the same thing. So on the root query object, we're going to have some mechanism, a field, to fetch these you know, movie categories, whatever. What would we decide to call it, Ian? Uh, movies by category. Movie, sure, movies by category, great. So we're going to add a field to query called movies by category, and it's going to return us an array of movies and it's going to be parameterized by a category. And that way, we can request uh, each of these uh, rows from the design. So if we, do we have that added in the query type? Yeah, so we're going to add movies by category. It's going to be parameterized by a category. And it's going to return us probably an array of movies, probably not a single movie, because we have a collection of those guys there. This guy's done. On to the next one. We have a screen that has a single movie on it. So when someone navigates to that screen, they're going to want details about that single movie. So we're going to extend the query type again to request a single movie. We're going to parameterize it with ID. It's going to return a movie. Same idea. Importantly, though, on this screen, we can actually do interesting stuff. Uh, we're not going to model that in the API too much, but you can imagine adding to list, downloading. Uh, those two things could be mutations, right? You want to take some action that's happening there. Uh, we're going to focus simply on the uh, heart box up there. So we want to like a movie. right? That's an action we're going to take. And you think about, well, why don't we add that like movie uh, thing to the movie type? And again, it's this problem of you need to be able to access it without having accessed anything else. So it has to belong to a root type. And it has to be serialized because you don't want to deal with nasty side effects. So anytime you're modifying data, anytime side effects are happening, you're going to be putting uh, that field into mutation. Uh, so in here, we have to uncomment yep, movie. And so we'll uncomment this mutation type at the bottom. Yeah. 
Uh, I've got to delete those guys. Yeah, the wonderful keyboard shortcut's not working here. Yep. <coughs> and GraphQL also doesn't uh, like empty objects or empty types. So you, uh, you can't have type mutation with nothing in it. So we're going to put like movie or something like that in there. It's going to be parameterized by a movie ID that we want to like and a flag saying whether or not we like the movie. And it's just going to return us, yeah, sure, a Boolean value. Um, we'll discuss a little bit later maybe uh, the return values for mutations. But again, you can imagine they work the same way as queries. Uh, yes? We've got a question here. Does GraphQL have a built-in concept of pagination or do you always have to build it? It does not have a built-in concept of pagination. However, there are certain frameworks that build on top of GraphQL that offer this facility. So Facebook's Relay, for example, is much more opinionated about how pagination should occur. Uh, versus something like Apollo, uh, which is much less opinionated about how pagination should occur, but it does provide you with a couple of patterns and tools for doing that kind of thing. So this is great, right? We've modeled our entire API already in like you know, 5, 10, 15 minutes. Uh, there's very few other API platforms that would allow you uh, this kind of speed and flexibility. So what we're going to do is we're going to explore that API. So you can go to this website called uh, graphqlbin.com. Remember to save your, um, your schema, your pad. And at the bottom, it's going to give you a uh, URL. Yeah, so you're going to click the Save button up there at the top. And at the bottom, it's going to give you this endpoint URL. And that's a real live GraphQL API URL. Right? You, you can take that, you can give that to someone else, and they can start using it today. So we're going to take that guy. We're going to go to GraphQL, uh, the GraphQL Playground, whose URL is graphqlbin.com. We're going to paste that bad boy in there. And this is another service that's going to be using our API. Super cool. And the fact that GraphQL is typed and allows us to introspect those types means we can actually explore our API visually. So at the top, there's a little button called Schema. And we can now see this is our API. We can look at um, movies by category. So we want to see what that's like. Oh, well, there's uh, all the parameters for that. There's the return type. We can look at the movie. Oh, movies got reviews. So we click on reviews and so on and so forth. And so you can, again, go back and forth between your design and your API, and you can say, oh, well, design's updated. We're going to tweak the API. Uh, does the API actually service our design? You can take that. You can give it to your web team, your iOS team, uh, whoever, and you can say, is this going to fit your needs? Uh, and it's a great way of doing quick prototyping uh, and getting something out the door without actually having to invest a whole lot of time. Uh, and yeah, so this is just a screenshot of, of, of that. So we've covered describing the data, but now we need to actually get the data. We have to do something useful with this guy. And getting the data is done with resolvers. This is going to get a little more complicated, maybe. The idea is that for every type and for every field on that type, GraphQL is going to execute a resolver for that field. So when we have a query object and we want the movie field of that query object, we're going to define some behavior. And that's what this function is doing. So the resolver's object uh, in the Apollo server e ecosystem is an object whose keys are types. So you can see that first level key there is query. It's going to map straight to that query type over there. The next guy underneath, uh, this subkey, movie, maps straight to that movie field over there. And you would just repeat the pattern for all other types that you defined. And the body of this guy is going to be executed every time we request that field. And the, we'll, we'll deal with the object parameter in just a little bit. Uh, but the params parameter there is going to be those parameterized values from our field query. So all we're going to do is we're going to take some list of movies. We're going to, excuse me, go through those movies. Look for the movie with some specific ID. If it matches up, we're going to return that. And you'll note that the return type of this movie field is a movie object. And what GraphQL is going to do is it's going to say, we're going to cast, we're going to coalesce, we're going to convert the result that you're returning into this movie. So when we start requesting fields from the movie, that base object that we return is what we're going to use when those fields are requested. 
This is a kind of hard concept to understand. Hopefully it gets a little bit more clear when we, when we start uh, building out the API. Uh, again, but the idea is when you return something that maps to a specific type, whenever you resolve a field of that type, the thing that you return is what's going to be used to resolve those fields. Resolver key points here. Resolvers describe how to access fields of a type. Anytime a field is requested, a resolver is executed to fetch that field. Uh, top level keys, so we just described the structure of that, uh, are uh, they map to type names, and the inner keys map to field names. And yeah, what we just talked about there, whatever you return from resolver <coughs> will be coalesced into the type that GraphQL needs. So our next task, we're going to add a super, super, super simple resolver uh, to the query type and make it return valid data for the movie with ID of one. And we can use this query to test that resolver. So same idea, uh, now we're going to go to the block of code there that says begin workshop task three, and it has a little template in there for you, which you can uncomment, and uh, you can Hopefully it'll decide to, uh, to work there. Yeah, uncomment that guy. Yeah, technology is hard even on the best of days. Yeah, return. And so now we're going to uh, return something when the ID is one. And we can make this really simple, right? We don't have to do complicated stuff. We can say, if the ID parameter is one, then we're going to return some movie uh, you know, some predestination movie, and uh, if it's not, we can return something else, or, or we can fully do it properly here too. We can look through that movies array. Uh, at the bottom of the file, you'll note that there is a lot of sample data, and so movies is available to you uh, at the bottom of that file there. So we've provided a whole bunch of movies that you can play with. Uh, and so we also have that query that we can use for testing. So if you type this query into the uh, box in the middle, this guy here is going to let you run queries against your API. So you can type that query into your box and you can check the result uh, on the far right hand side. Isaac, yes? Another question. Does it always throw S's on the plurals of types? Yeah, that's where I asked that before you showed the magical content oh, at the bottom. <laughs> oh. Gotcha. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no worries, no worries. Yeah, that, that variable, instead of using that variable, normally you would have like a database or another external API that you would call or something like that. Um, but we're, we're doing super simple. Um, yep, so we're going to test with that query. I think it's movie singular. Yeah, one. And yeah, so, so again, you get like syntax highlighting and error checking, all this great stuff that the majority of other API services don't let you do. Um, so yeah, so we just write a little bit of code. Uh, we can pretend that's a magic database, and we get results back from our API. Now things are going to get a little bit spicy. So we have a movie, but we need to calculate the movie's rating. And we know that the movie's rating is, uh, you know, we sum up all the ratings of a review for a movie, and, and then we take the average of all those ratings. We're not going to do that in our calculation. We're just going to do something super, super simple. But you can think of this as kind of a computed property almost, right? If you're using uh, Rails or Phoenix, you have some kind of models, and you can have virtual fields or computed properties on them. And so we know a movie has a rating. And we added a resolver for the query type. And we had, a, we had a movie field, and we showed how to, given a query object, how to resolve the movie field of that query object. Now we have a movie object, right? At the, at the top, we return the movie object. Now we have a movie object. And what we're describing is how to access the rating field of that movie object. And by default, GraphQL just returns the field value with the same name, but we're going to add some explicit behavior here. And so that first parameter, right? remember we said we're describing how to access the rating field of a movie object. And that first parameter is going to be that movie object. So whatever we return from that first function is going to be piped in as the argument of the second function here. And the idea is 
anywhere, anywhere you return a movie, you can select a rating from it, and this function will be executed. No matter how you select that movie, as soon as you access the rating field of that movie, this resolver is going to be executed. Uh, and all we're going to do is make it such that the movie with the ID of 1 has a good rating, and all the other movies have a bad rating. And this is the idea that every time a field is accessed, a uh, resolver is run, whether you define one or not. So you don't have to define a resolver for a field. GraphQL is going to make one implicitly for you most of the time, and that's what it's going to look like, right? So if we want to access the title field of a movie object, the simplest thing to do is just return movie.title. And because it's so simple and so common, GraphQL just does that for you automatically. So you can change this behavior to do whatever you want. You can call out to a database or external API, it doesn't matter. Uh, this is the great thing about GraphQL is it abstracts access of fields away for you. And so one day, maybe your data comes from an array, and the next day, maybe it comes from IMDB or somewhere else. And as a consumer of the API, you don't care. You just access the field, and then GraphQL, your resolvers, and your schema do all the magic for you behind the scenes. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to add one more resolver. We're going to implement that rating field resolver for the movie type, make it return a good rating for predestination and a bad rating for everything else. And we can use that query to test it. So over on this guy, yeah, we have the, the um, movie type there, the rating field, the movie object. We're going to check to see if that movie is predestination. We're going to do that by checking if the movie's ID is equal to 1, uh, which is a string in this case. Yeah. And then if it is, we're going to return some big value, like 5. And if it isn't, we're going to return some small value, like 0, or 1.2, or, or whatever. And then when we select the rating of our movie 1, which we can do now, hopefully, when it updates, everyone's using the service, and so it's slowing to a crawl here. But when it works, uh, you'll see that requesting movie 1 will give you a rating of 5, and requesting any other movie will give you a rating of 0. We're probably just going to keep moving along here, and Ian will keep attempting to make it work, and hopefully the internet will not go crazy. So uh, queries. So, so we've described how to describe what the data is going to be like. We've also described how the actual values of that data is synthesized. Oh, it's working now. Very good. So we can access that rating. And you can see rating 5 for movie 1. We're going to swap movie to movie 4 or something else. Rating 1. So everything's working exactly as intended. So yeah, queries. We, we talked about uh, how to define the types of things, how to, define, uh, how to access those types and values. And now we want to talk about how to communicate with the GraphQL server. We've given you some predefined queries. So you have a little bit of idea of how they work, uh, but we're going to break them down very explicitly. So every GraphQL query is composed of an operation type, an operation name, and then a field selection. The operation type tells GraphQL what root object you want to start picking stuff out of. So we have that query root type and root corresponding root object. So having the query operation type will tell GraphQL that, hey, we would like to start pulling data out of that root query type. Instead of query, you could also have mutation or subscription or any of the other root types. The next thing, operation name. This is not used by servers so much, but quite often used by clients. So if you're using Apollo uh, or something else, being able to define multiple operations in a single query is sometimes useful. Again, something that REST doesn't do very well, right? You want to perform multiple operations uh, in REST, and you don't want to send 500 different requests. Well, in REST, a lot of times, you're just out of luck. And in GraphQL, no problem. You can define multiple queries in one, in one file in one go. Uh, and that's usually what the query name is used for. And then field selections. This is the most important part. That query name, and then we got the open brackets. And so we know from that first line, we have a query type. And so we're selecting values from that query type. And so the, the brackets are matching there, basically. So we want the movie field from the query type. We could select any field that we want from that query. We could select movies by category. We could select whatever we want. We want to select that movie field. And we know the result of that movie field is going to be a movie type. And so we're going to want to expand that type too. And for every type that we select that is a type that has fields, we're going to have to expand those fields. We're going to have to keep telling GraphQL, yes, I want this. Yes, I want this. 
And the idea behind that is so that GraphQL knows which resolvers to run, and it knows that if maybe there's an expensive resolver that gets added later, you don't accidentally ever want to request more data than you need. And so again, that whole idea of a graph, right? That's what this looks like. You're going to request the movie field on the root query type, parameterize it with ID 1. So you get a movie back. And from there, you're going to request the title field on that movie, which is going to resolve to something. You're also going to request the actors field. But you know that the actors field is a bunch of actors. And so you need to request the fields on an actor. And so from an actor, we're going to request their name. But maybe we don't care about their age or their country or all this other metadata. So GraphQL. The query mechanism lets you explore the type graph that you have defined. You can keep saying, I want this, I want this, I want this. And combined with the resolvers, GraphQL will link the two together and basically allow you to describe to GraphQL explicitly every piece of information that you want. So this is just what we talked about. Resolvers for a field are only executed when you request them. There's no special syntax for lists. So we looked at the actors one previously. right? We requested uh, the name field of an actor, and we, there was no magic notation for lists there. Uh, the only difference is the result you get back is either going to be a list or not a list, depending on the type. You must specify the fields you want from a type if that type has fields. So for ints, floats, strings, obviously you don't need to do any of that. they are scalars. Uh, for everything else, you need to specify explicitly, yes, I want this, yes, I want that. And in certain cases, you can request the same field more than once. You can do things like field aliasing. Um, we won't get into that too much. You can also end up fetching the same object more than once, right? So you could explore the graph, right? You could say, I want this movie, and I want this movie similar movies, and I want the similar movie similar movies. And you could end up with some circular thing. Um, but GraphQL avoids this infinite recursion by forcing you, again, you have to request every field that you want, so it won't unfurl them infinitely. Even though there's a circle in that graph, you only requested it three levels deep, and so everything's fine. So the final task, and uh, hopefully we're going to have a little bit of time at the end of this talk. Uh, you can basically go take that API boilerplate template, and there's a whole bunch of sample data. You can plug her in. You can ask me questions. You can ask Ian questions. Uh, we'll field them for you. We'll help you build out your uh, API. So that's going to be the last thing that we're going to get you to do here. Um, yeah, so you have all the basics. The mutation type, we don't have a database. This is some serverless architecture voodoo. Uh, setting variables, doing anything, it will just get blown out every request. So uh, leave the mutation type alone. You won't be very happy if you try and do things. It'll just be very confused. Uh, yeah, you can test your resolvers by writing simple queries. And the true rating algorithm, uh, if you get that far, is to simply average all the review ratings for a movie. Uh, and this is what you'll get. So at the end, you can click this magic download button, and you have a zip file you can npm install. Uh, you can send it to Heroku. You have a real API. Uh, you can take it to your friends, and you say, look, I've made this amazing GraphQL API. Pay me a lot of money. And this is how you profit from GraphQL. Uh, the bottom link here is the finished version of that API that Ian has graciously completed. Uh, so if you want the cheat codes, you want the answers to everything, that's in that URL down there. You want to know that your API actually works, plug this guy in. If you can resolve this query, you're in a very good place. We'll talk super briefly about the front end. Uh, I had some fantastical dreams about doing a lot more in this presentation, but there's just not enough time. And we could do a whole talk on the front end, too. Super common stack, Apollo, GraphQL, React. This is probably the most common stack you're going to see out there today. And the idea is you define a whole bunch of these queries, and then you make components that consume those queries. So you make a component. You'll feed that query into your component. Uh, Apollo, which is a GraphQL client, is going to do a whole bunch of like, dark magic behind the scenes, uh, handles caching and only requesting fields that you haven't already fetched, and uh, all sorts of wonderful stuff for you. Uh, and so when you get the data back, again, this, this important bit here, data.movie.title, right? the shape of the response is exactly uh, the shape of the field that you request. So it makes it super easy to um, not have to worry about, oh, do I need to look at this field or that field? Whatever you describe in your query is exactly what you're going to get back. Uh, and Apollo just provides you the React framework to do that. If you're using, excuse me, if you're using iOS or Android or a native client or something else, uh, there's other client libraries. Apollo also has native libraries for iOS and Android uh, if you want to explore that realm. So we'll just wrap up a little bit. This has been Super Whirlwind Tour. Uh, there are more advanced features, unions, interfaces, enums, and inputs for the type system. Uh, again, most REST APIs, the, no REST API I know has unions. And unions are awesome. Uh, there are more advanced resolver features. So you can do batching, authentication, error handling, async stuff. Uh, we never covered any of that. There are a lot more complex things you can do with querying, including fragments, field aliases, 
and operation parameterization. Uh, there's other functionality entirely, uh, subscriptions. So being able to do real-time updates. So if you have uh, tweets going out and you want to subscribe to new tweets, GraphQL provides you an opinionated facility for doing that. Again, something a lot of other REST APIs don't even do. Uh, so having this cohesive ecosystem really is what makes GraphQL so powerful and all the tooling that's surrounding it. Uh, and again, yeah, even at the bottom there are GraphQL tools. So if you're writing an iOS client, for those of you who have familiarity with Objective-C or Swift or any other language that's not JavaScript that has a horrible type system, uh, you actually have to define what you're going to access. So Apollo has this tool to actually convert your schema into uh, Swift classes or uh, Objective-C models or what have you. And it makes it just, life is so easy uh, when you have a type system. Further learning. So my favorite framework, Absinthe and Apollo, you can go to howtographql.com and you can follow their tutorial there. It's awesome, uh, highly recommended. GraphQL.org for you know, the, the high level overview and they have all sorts of links, information, tutorials there. Uh, Apollo GraphQL, you're doing uh, anything in JavaScript with GraphQL, that's where you want to go. Absinthe GraphQL is the framework for Elixir. There was someone in here who talked about Phoenix. Phoenix is awesome, Elixir is awesome, and so is Absinthe. Highly recommend you check it out. Uh, thanks for coming. We got 20 minutes, which hopefully is enough time for you to play around uh, in that API sandbox and uh, make something cool. If you have questions, I am super happy to field them uh, and help people out on their awesome APIs. So you've got a couple of questions. Yes. Waiting for you already. Um, first one is, do you have any more analogies for resolvers, please? Because one that I have not addressed. Uh, analogies. What do we mean by analogies for resolvers? First, I don't have a name. On, I've just got first name, last name. That's for this. <laughs> yeah, that, that is. I think by far the most complicated part uh, of GraphQL. The the idea is we start with an initial object, right? So we make a new GraphQL server. We start with an object. Uh, we don't really care what that object is, but we can just pretend we have an object. And when we request a query, we're expanding uh, that query type, right? So we have query uh, something up here, right? Query, and we're expanding that movie field. And we're expanding the movie field of a root query object. So we actually have an object available to us to expand that thing of. But 99% of the time, we just ignore it, uh, which is why in, if, you go to the, if we go to the resolvers over here for the in query, where movie is, scroll up. Yeah, there we are. So we have movies.find and then something here. And we ignored this is object parameter right there, which we just blatantly disregarded. And so it's this idea of we start with one object, and we keep unfurling down the tree. And this root object we ignored, and we returned a movie. Uh, or, or, sorry, we, didn't return, we returned something, right? We returned the result of this. And whatever that thing is, is going to be turned into a movie, because our type system declared that the result of this field is going to be a movie. So we had an initial query object. We didn't really know what it was. We discarded that. We turned it into a movie. Then we're going to access some fields on the movie. And whenever we want to access a field on the movie, we're going to follow that exact same pattern. We're going to take that initial object, that movie that we've basically given ourselves, and we're going to describe how to access the fields of that object. In theory, Instead of returning movies.find something, 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 we could return a number from there, right? We could say return three. And what's going to happen is when we request the rating field of a movie, that first argument is going to be three. So the idea is that internally, you can use whatever representation you want for your objects. Could be database a handle or a model of some kind. Doesn't matter. You can use whatever you want. It's only at those leaf nodes, the very edge when you're unfurling those things, you can transform that internal representation into something that you're going to send out or further down the pipeline. So you only need a resolver for those leaf nodes if you want to transform the data in some way. Exactly, yeah. Be because there's this implicit resolver, uh, because a lot of times you have an object and you're just going to return a field with the same name. So if you return an object that has a key foo, and you have a field in your type system called foo, GraphQL will automatically link those two together by default. You don't have to do that. It's just there for convenience. That probably confused more people than it helped. I don't know. It's, it's one of those things that you just kind of have to build the API. And when you see how it works for yourself, it's much, much easier to understand when you start playing with it. All right. If you were fetching these values from a database, how would you write resolvers to reduce the number of queries? That's from Rob. 
by reduced number of queries, I'm assuming this is reduced number of database queries. And there's all sorts of funny patterns for doing this. Uh, most common one is using this thing called data loaders, which is a pattern uh, developed by Facebook. And a lot of GraphQL systems have explicit facilities. So what you're going to do is when you have these resolvers, the GraphQL server system is going to provide you a mechanism for kind of collecting queries as you go. And so if you have a bunch of fields in parallel, the system is going to allow you to collect the queries for those fields. And then it's going to be able to resolve all those queries at once. You can aggregate them however you want. And then it's going to feed them down to the next layer of the graph. And then all of those can be aggregated together, transformed, or whatever. And you can just keep going down that process. Um, we have a question from someone. Apollo Launchpad alternative crashed and lost my project, even though it saved it several times. So. The real alternative is to download yourself you know, NPM, Node.js. You can spin up your own editor. The reason I don't typically do this in workshops is because the heterogeneity of technology in this room is massive, and one person's Apollo is just going to explode, and you know, another person's end is going to be a giant nightmare and mess, and we're going to spend the majority of our time trying to set up our, our dev environments. And if you tell people to, please come with this prepared, never happens. So you give them a URL, everyone's happy. <laughs> um, yeah, it would be great if it uh, was a little more reliable. Unfortunately, this is kind of what we're stuck with. Uh, you can take, you can go to a Launchpad, click Download. You can follow the instructions in there, and you can just complete the workshop offline in you know, VS Code or Atom or Sublime or Vim or Emacs or whatever floats your boat. Oh, yeah, good. that's a good point as well. If you did manage to save it, you can click your profile at the top, and there's a link that says pads you created. So your stuff might actually still be under there. Um, how do you stop the API user from briefing the server with malicious deep queries? <laughs> <laughs> this, is, no, this is a great question. And in fact, there is an open issue on Absinthe for this exact thing. Uh, stopping malicious users in general is a problem. This is not specific to GraphQL, right? Because people can do all sorts of nasty things to your server uh, without you realizing it. Uh, GraphQL obviously suffers from potentially more processing overhead uh, for like, individual queries. And basically, when that GraphQL thing gets sent to your server, your server will transform that query into an abstract syntax tree. And it can do a little bit of analysis on that tree. So you can roughly estimate the complexity of some things. And in fact, uh, I don't know much about Apollo because most of the production servers I write are in Absinthe, but Absinthe allows you to place a limit on the, com the estimated complexity of a query so people can't send absolutely ridiculous things to your server. Um, you can also do stuff like blacklisting, so you could set up a uh, Redis instance, and if you notice that you're getting a whole bunch of requests from some IP or some subset of IPs that are taking a million years to run, you can just simply black hole those IPs and, and not worry about it again, because they're probably coming from some country that isn't here. <laughs> All right, and do you see GraphQL in the workplace? Uh, yeah, I definitely do. The last project I worked on, uh, we followed this exact pattern where we had some designs that designers were to us. And so we're an agency, right? or rather, I work for an agency, Metal Lab. And we get contracted out by a whole bunch of people who want to build cool stuff. And a lot of times, they don't always have all their ducks in a row. So they said, oh, we, you know, we want this grand, we have this grand vision for this thing we're going to build. It's going to be amazing. Uh, we have some existing infrastructure in place. And then you know, this, is the, this is the design dream. We have all these screens laid out. This is what we're going to do. It's going to be awesome. And we're like, oh, yeah, this is great. So can we uh, get a handle on your API and start pulling data? We're like, uh, we don't have an API yet. So you can use this to start building out the API that you want. And you don't have to worry about whatever they're doing. Because when their stuff is done, you can just plug in their API into Resolvers, call it a day. It's great. Um, so this definitely has uh, seen use in production. And it's awesome uh, for doing API proxying. So you can set up your GraphQL endpoint uh, the way you want it. And you can basically model your API on the design. And then the real service that sits somewhere else, you can just defer that until later. That, um, one last question. Will the final code be available? It is, yes. Uh, I guess I should go back to that particular screen. It is right there. So if you check out the slides, you can hit up this chunk of code um, and download it and go wild. And if it breaks, you can blame me in. So. <laughs> <laughs>